All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Uh, my name is John Mueller. I am a Webmaster Trends Analyst here at Google in Switzerland. And part of what we do are these Office Hour Hangouts. And today, we're trying a fairly different setup um, because the, the YouTube Live Hangouts are going away soon. So we'll see how, how this works out. Um, as always, there are a bunch of questions that, that were submitted. I can run through some of those. But if any of you want to get started with the first question, feel free to jump on in. If not, it looks like you're all muted. So I don't know if you, you probably need to unmute to speak up. But otherwise, I'll just get started. And you can jump in whenever something pops up. All right. Let's see the questions. Um, so the first one is fairly long. My question contains a little bit of critique on Google's practices recently. Um, and I, it essentially goes into the general theme of Google showing stuff in the search results, and then webmasters not seeing so many clicks to the website, and like how far will this lead in the future? Where does Google draw the line? Um, I, I think, first of all, th thank you for this question. I, I think it's something that is really important for us. Uh, it's something that uh, it make is is really something uh, on the top of our mind essentially every day as we work in search and we kind of work with different search features. Uh, it's something that is is critical for us for the long term kind of survival of the the web ecosystem and kind of the search ecosystem. In that uh, we need to make sure that when when you're providing something for a search that you also get enough back that there is really kind of this, this kind of a, almost like a deal between Google and the, the, the publishers in the sense that if you work hard to create some good content and we can show that in search and send traffic your way, that uh, the traffic that you get from that is, is worthwhile your effort. And uh, that's something that comes into play essentially for every search feature that we have, uh, regardless of how much we show in search or how little we show in search. Uh, it's something that, that is always kind of there. And on the other hand, I think this is also something from, from a publisher side that you can also keep an eye on. Uh, where you can think about like what what do you want to provide in search and which kind of content would you prefer to only provide on your website? Uh, there are different mechanisms that you can use to to do that, and uh, through those you you can kind of uh, adjust that over time as well. And finally, I think there's one aspect that's also really important in that uh, for, for most businesses when they're online with a website, the actual important metric for them is not how many clicks they get from search, uh, but more like how many customers they get. How do they convert those customers? Uh, so for example, if you're a small business that is active in, in a local community and someone is searching for your opening hours, they don't need to go to your website to see those opening hours. That's not really the, the way that you kind of get value back out of search. But rather, if they see those opening hours directly in the search results, they'll be able to come by and visit your, your business in person when, when it's open. Uh, so a lot of these things are aspects where uh, people don't necessarily need to go to a website directly to kind of bring value back. To, to that business. Uh, but anyway, this is something that, from, from my point of view, I don't think there is an absolute answer. And I, I suspect there'll be some shifts back and forth over time as things settle down, as new aspects in search kind of become available, as new types of user behavior becomes more prominent, uh, as new types of websites kind of show up and uh, move along. So that's something where I expect 
this to kind of shift a little bit over time. Uh, but in general, it is something that we care about deeply. And it is something that we, we don't take lightly. It's not that we just go out there and say, well, we can do this in the search results. Therefore, we will do that. Uh, but rather, where we think about like what what does it actually mean? What what does this provide? How does this provide value for the user? And how does this provide value for the publishers as well? All right. Um, Presumably, John, you, you Google doesn't make any money if no one ever leaves the search results anyway. So you need people to keep clicking on things. I I think that's probably the case. I mean. Yeah. Um, but no, one, no one's going to advertise if the answers are always front and center. It will get to the point where people will say, well, that's the end of my budget, which is the end of Google. I, I think that's, that's kind of the, the long-term look as well, anyway. It's, uh, as long as there's kind of this, this notion of search is useful to give you more detailed information, then I think that's, that's something that keeps people coming back to search. Uh, whereas if they just get all of the answers directly, then like, they, they don't even need to look into more details. And then like, why do we even index more content? But uh, it's, it's always tricky, because you're balancing kind of short-term interests and long-term interests. And with, with any business, it's like you, you kind of struggle with that as well. Um, my client is a federal medical center, and all content goes through the doctors first before it uh, is published on the website. I think it's a good idea to let our users and Google know that the information on the website is trustworthy. Uh, I understand that I might just add, for instance, some info about the doctor who checked the information and some words like, the content was checked before publication by Dr. John Mueller. Uh, and also put a link to their personal web page. Uh, but what's the best way to tell Google about this? What should and should I do it at all? Um, so I think, first of all, should I do it at all? I, I think that's something that you probably have answered already in that uh, if you're providing information on your web page and it is kind of checked or written, created by someone who, who has a lot of knowledge on that topic, then that's something I, I would definitely highlight. Uh, so there are lots of ways that you can highlight that on your web pages. You can link to those profiles. You can put text on the pages. Uh, anything to really show users when they come to your pages that there's actually something valuable here, that they can trust this information, um, that this is something that's reliable, that they can forward on to their friends without having to worry that maybe it's not correct or, or, or so. so in, in that regard, anything that you can do to make that clear, that probably makes sense for users. That's something you can also check with normal A-B testing. And uh, that probably also makes sense for, uh, for search engines in that regard as well. Um, my question is regarding duplicacy in content. Many students who are studying for a certain degree uh, recognizable worldwide, and they're getting the same questions for their assignments. I am associated with some people who are providing information and solutions to students who are looking to for an answer on the internet. Uh, my question is that if I publish their assignment questions, uh, which are quite lengthy and the same worldwide, and the solutions, which might be different, on my website, and other competitors do the same, does Google consider all of this content duplicate content? Uh, wow. I, I wish I had this kind of service as a kid. Uh, it would have made my homework so much easier. I don't know if I would have learned as much, but fine. Uh, so in general, what, what happens here is we would probably recognize that certain blocks of text on this page are the same uh, across multiple pages. Uh, the whole page themselves are, are different, of course. So we would index all of these pages because they're unique pages. Uh, but there are certain blocks of text that are the same. And uh, in practice, what would happen here is if someone is searching just for one of those blocks of text, uh, we would probably pick one or two, 
maybe a handful of sites that uh, have this text on them and show those in the search results, because the other sites where, where the same text is on there would essentially show the same thing. So for example, if you have a really long question and someone searches for the first sentence in that question, uh, then we, we would assume that these pages are essentially about the same topic. And we would pick maybe a couple of those that we know and show those in the search results. And it's not that the others would be uh, shown less visibly in search or would be ranked lower. Uh, but rather that just we would filter them out because we, we think that essentially this is the same thing. The snippet that we would show in the search results is the same thing uh, across all of those users. Uh, so that's essentially what, what would happen there. Um, with regards to duplicate content, we would consider that block to be duplicate content. But again, the whole page itself, because you have a different answer, uh, that would be something that we would consider to be unique. We would index those separately. Uh, so from that point of view, I, I think it's fine to go down this route. Um, I, I think from, from a practical point of view, if you're just starting down this direction and there are already a lot of sites out there that are covering the same questions, especially if you say that the assignment questions are the same worldwide, then there's probably going to be a lot of competition. And uh, I don't know if, if with a new website, it, it would be that easy to get in to kind of this big, bigger group of sites that are providing content essentially on the same theme. Um, a page has FAQ contents, which are written on images and uh, in their alt text, but not on the body text. Uh, is that OK with the rich result guidelines uh, to mark that up? Um, I, I think, theoretically, we might be able to pick that up. But uh, practically, I would recommend making sure that the text is actually visible on the page. Uh, so what, what kind of happens with the alt attribute for images is we do pull that into the page. Uh, so it's, it's kind of on the page. We, we can kind of see that. It's obviously not as good as if we have normal, real HTML text that we can pull in. Uh, so that's one aspect. And on the other hand, uh, for the rich results types, we do check to see if this text that you, you've marked up, for example, if you're using JSON-LD markup where it's not marking up the HTML itself, uh, we do check to see if that is actually visible on the page. Uh, so that's something which is kind of colliding in a, in a weird gray zone area where I would say it's possible that it would work, but it's definitely not, not guaranteed. And it's probably not something that I would try to rely on. So if you really need to uh, have the FAQ uh, rich results visible for your pages, or if there's some other type of rich result type that you really want to target, then I'd recommend making sure that you're really using text on the page and not uh, putting the text in images. Um, I see that Google does web hosting with a specific web domain. Uh, I'm learning every day, and I was wondering if you can use WordPress on a domain hosted by Google. Uh, at this time, I'm using WordPress with another company hosting the domain and using Google products like YouTube for my business. Uh, is there any advantage or disadvantage to group everything under Google? Uh, so first of all, I don't know exactly how, how the hosting side at Google works. So that's something kind of on the side. My understanding is uh, you, you can run normal servers on Google Cloud, for example. And with that, you could run WordPress as well. Uh, but uh, my, my understanding there is you basically have to configure those servers yourself, and you have to get all of that set up and maintained yourself. So probably there's a lot of technical effort involved in running WordPress on Google Cloud. And if you're just getting started, maybe that's uh, kind of too much to, to really make sense for a smaller website when, when you're just getting started. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's possible there are easier ways to do that on Google Cloud nowadays, but that's kind of how I remember it. 
There are other setups that you can use that uh, run on Google Cloud as well, which are a lot easier to use, uh, for example, Blogger or Google Sites. Um, however, they're set up completely separately. So if you're currently using WordPress, you'd have to essentially recreate your whole website on those other services. Um, my recommendation in general for this would be to try to find a good, good hoster. If you want to continue using WordPress, um, maybe you already have a good hoster that's taking care of things like updates and making sure that all of the security patches are installed, uh, all of those things. Those are really important if you're hosting your website uh, with a service like WordPress. Uh, so that's kind of what, what I would aim for there. Uh, with regards to hosting everything under Google or not, that's something from a search point of view is totally up to you. Uh, you can use everything on one hoster. You can use multiple hosters to, to host your content. Uh, you can even do things like hosting your, your textual content with one provider and your images with another provider. Uh, that's something that, that some, some sites like to do. Uh, there's no advantage or disadvantage from a, a search engine optimization point of view of hosting everything together. Uh, there, there are sometimes speed effects that play a role, where if depending on you set, how you set up your hosting, how you configure it, your, your website might be faster or be a little bit slower. Uh, but those are kind of technical details that apply to any kinds of hosting. So it doesn't matter from, from our point of view for search if if you host everything Google, with Google or if you host everything with different providers, that's totally up to you. And uh, from a practical point of view, I would aim for something that uh, is, is secure, that works well in the long run, and that makes it easy for you to maintain. Uh, so you essentially decide like, what level of effort you want to put in for maintenance. And if you're OK with doing a lot of hands-on work to keep your server running, then maybe you host it yourself. Uh, if you prefer to have someone else take care of this and make sure that nothing breaks while you're on vacation, then I would work to find a good hoster that all does all of this for you. Wow. All of the, the people trying to join in kind of keeps pinging up here, and I have to admit them all in individually. So that's kind of weird. I hope you don't hear the, the ping noise every time. Um, We'll see if I can find a way to avoid that. Uh, I'm having a toughest time getting the mobile index to recognize my site's new code. The desktop box sees and indexes the update, but on mobile, Google still sees and displays the old site's code, meta tags, et cetera. Um, I would probably need to know a URL from your website. So it sounds like you posted this before. Uh, if you have a, a thread in the Webmaster Help Forum that I could take a look at, that might be useful. Uh, in general, it's not that we have a separate index for mobile, mobile indexing. Uh, essentially, we, we have one main index. And in that index, we keep either the mobile version or the desktop version, depending on whether or not uh, a site has switched to mobile-first indexing. And uh, that's essentially the version that we use in search. Uh, the, the one aspect that's a little bit, I don't know, different uh, is if you have a separate mobile site, then we will index, again, the same, the same version, so either the mobile or the desktop version. Uh, but we show the separate mobile site in the search results for users on mobile devices. Uh, so that might be something that you're seeing, that we're showing the, the separate mobile URL uh, for users on mobile. Another thing that you might be seeing is that uh, in the mobile search results, the UI is, is a little bit more limited in the sense that this, the page isn't as big as on a desktop. Uh, so things like titles and descriptions, they have to be a little bit shorter. Uh, and that might also be something that you're seeing, that uh, on desktop, we're able to show your full title, for example. And on mobile, we have to shorten it to match what uh, would fit on the screen. And by shortening it, we essentially process it algorithmically to figure out what would be a good title for this search result. 
And uh, sometimes that can result in our algorithms picking something that's not really what you would want to pick. Uh, so it's not so much that we're indexing the wrong version of your pages, but more that we're indexing a version of your page. And the one that we're showing in the search results, that might not be the one that uh, you'd prefer to have shown. Uh, but I'm, I'm kind of guessing here at this point, because I don't really know what your site is and what that looks like. So if you have a thread in the Webmaster Help Forum where you could point to and where you have some details on what the search results look like, that would be really useful. Yeah, hi, John. Hi. So uh, regarding this M dot and WW, I just wanted to know one thing. Uh, what happens, uh, just reverse-wise, what happens if uh, one, one person does not have content in desktop but has content in mobile and a smartphone is redirected to M dot? In this case, in desktop, that content will be shown, just reverse to older days. Um, so, so how do you mean again? If, if like 1% uh, of the website is desktop only? Uh, no, 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 not like this. But uh, some piece of the content is available in M dot version, which is not available in WWW version or desktop version. Mm -hmm. And mobile dot, because it is mobile first, so it is redirected to M dot, finds mm -hmm. that content. In this case, the truth is that in desktop, that is not available. How Google will assume that in desktop, whether it is available or not? Um, with with mobile first indexing, we would only index the content on the mobile page. So if there's less content on the mobile page, we would be able to index less. And if there's more content on the mobile page, we would be able to index more. Uh, we would still show the desktop URL for users on desktop, um, but we we would show those search results based on what we've indexed for the mobile version. So it means that the chances are that in desktop, the content is not available. It's still, Google will show in desktop result. That's that's possible, yeah. I mean, cool. it's it's pr it's probably pretty rare, but theoretically, it's it's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, <laughs> thanks. Sure. All right. Um... Uh, is using display none for text images uh, content bad for SEO? For example, I want to hide some keywords, as I suppose it doesn't make any sense, but web webmasters still do it. Um, so you you can hide text on a page. Uh, essentially, from, from our webmaster guidelines, we, we do have a guideline that uh, says you should not use hidden text on a page. Uh, so that's one thing to, to kind of watch out for there. Uh, from, from a practical point of view, there's sometimes reasons why you would hide something, for example, on an initial load of the page, where maybe you have a tabbed interface where if you click on like one part of the, the page, then it switches to a different tab and suddenly makes that content visible. Uh, from our point of view, that's perfectly fine. So if, if someone from the web spam team were to look at a web page like that, then the initial kind of hidden content on the page uh, is clear for the web spam team that actually this content can be made visible. So it's not problematic from, from that point of view. Um, however, if you're using display none just to hide text to try to put more keywords on a page, then that's something where the web spam team might take action on that. That's also something where our algorithms in general might take action on that and say, well, that looks a lot like keyword stuffing. And uh, in, in general, I would recommend if there is something important on your page that you want this page to rank for, make sure that it's visible on the page. Don't, don't hide it somewhere. Uh, because it's something that search engines do watch out for this. Uh, they are able to recognize which parts of a page are visible and not. And it's something that users kind of watch out for as well, where if we show them something in search and they click on it and they go to that page and actually what they were looking for is not there at all, then they, they will feel misled. They'll go back to search and search for something else. And they'll feel that Google did them a misservice by sending them to, to a site like this. Uh, so from that point of view, if there's something you want to have shown in search and you want to have users find your pages for, 
then make sure that it's visible. Don't, don't hide it. Don't be shy with that. And at the same time, don't think that you artificially need to stuff words into your page that users wouldn't have any use for. Uh, but rather think about like what what kind of the the long term goals of your site are, and uh, make sure that if you want to rank for something, that you actually have content for that, so that when users come to your web page, that they kind of are all in in the mood of like, well, this is really fantastic content. I should recommend it to other people as well. Um, I have a client with an online store. Uh, it's a custom website. Their products have many variations, like size, uh, different diameters, and so on for a single product. Uh, they're listed as separate products, which means that one product is listed multiple times because uh, so somehow I got muted. OK. Uh, so it means that one product is Um, so basically, one product is listed multiple times uh, for, for different sizes, uh, which is, is something where like the product description is the same on all variations. How much is an, of an issue is that? Uh, from, so, so this is a, a fairly common setup and a fairly common question that uh, people bring up every now and then. Uh, from our point of view, if you have a, a product with a lot of different variations, there are essentially two approaches that you can take. Um, one is to make sure that uh, the product and all variations are indexed separately so that you have, uh, for example, I don't know, a, a piece of pipe in 85 millimeters diameter and a piece of pipe in 100 millimeters diameter and so on. Uh, that's that's one approach. The other approach would be to say that you just have the individual products uh, on on the website, and all of the variations are listed on that product page. So you would have one product being a piece of pipe, and you have 85 millimeters, 100 millimeters, 150 millimeters diameter, all of these variations as well. Uh, so that's those are kind of the the two approaches that you can take there. Um, and uh, from, from a practical point of view, I usually recommend that uh, you try to work on uh, having fewer URLs rather than more URLs. So I would tend towards trying to go to having one product and all of those variations listed on that same product page, uh, just because it makes it a lot easier for us to kind of crawl the rest of your website because you don't have as many URLs. And because of you, you only having one main product page for this type of product, it's something where it's a lot easier for us to recognize that, well, this is really the landing page that you want to have shown for queries about this product. Uh, so that's that's kind of the, the one approach. The On the other side, if you're saying that the individual variations of this product are so important that people explicitly search them out, uh, then maybe it would make sense to have individual landing pages for that. Uh, for example, if you have different size pipes, maybe that's not so much of an issue. But if you have this one really unique size uh, that is not, not a standard size that people need for, I don't know, some, some random purpose, and they explicitly search for that, then that's something where maybe it would make sense to um, essentially provide that on a separate page as well. So those are kind of the, the two approaches that I would take there. With regards to how much of a problem is it to having all of the variations listed as individual products, uh, that's not really that much of a problem. Uh, like I said, it's really more a matter of, well, we have to crawl all of these different variations. We have to index them all individually. And we have to figure out which one of these pages to show prominently for your, your site for queries for that product. So it's something where probably for different sizes, it would make sense to fold them together. For things that are really unique variations, I would tend to separate them out into separate uh, products. Good job.
Hi. Hey, so I have one similar question on that. So we have a hotel website then for our hotel rooms or for the specific hotels. So we do provide our landing pages and that basically, I mean, our tag team basically implemented a structure where it's keep on changing like with the parameter. So how do we going to tackle that part? Like, I mean, we have already added canonical, but I mean, I have seen a lot of kind of uh, the indexing or the crawling is starting happening for all those kind of variations of the water. So is there kind of only way to come and we can handle just by the canonicals or like come I and somehow we can further fix it like come I and so that Google can able to see that way they have a lot of variation for this particular product, but I mean ultimately I mean we want to rank for one page. I I didn't quite understand the, the whole question. There's a lot of noise in the background. Um, I I think what, what you're saying is you you have a lot of different URL variations for the same product page, essentially? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, so that feels like it's, it's essentially a, a question of how to encourage Google to pick one canonical URL and focus the crawling and indexing on that one. Is that right? True. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So for, for that, there, there are different things that, that you could do. Uh, if this is something that is really on a large scale for your website, then I would recommend looking at the URL parameter handling tools, uh, especially if these different URL variations are with different parameters attached to it. So everything behind the question mark, uh, where you have maybe, I don't know, affiliate key equals this, or um, I don't know, color variations equals this, uh, then that's something with the uh, URL parameter handling tool. You can give us a lot of information on which URL parameters are important and which ones we, we can skip. Uh, that's that's one thing. The URL parameter handling tool is is a bit tricky in the sense that if you uh, tell us parameters are meant to be ignored and actually they're important for your website, then probably we will still ignore them. Uh, so that's something where you have to make sure that you're not uh, telling us to ignore too much. The other things that can help are essentially the normal things that you would do within a website. Uh, so trying to make sure that all of the internal linking goes directly to the URLs that you want to have kept. Uh, that's, that's something that, that helps a lot, um, that ideally you have redirect set up to the URLs that you want to have kept, uh, that you use URL canonical to tell us about the URL that you prefer to have kept for those individual variations and that you put the version that you want to have kept in the sitemap files as well. So with all of those uh, kind of hints that you can give us there, that's something where if we have noticed that there are multiple URLs, that they, they lead to essentially the same product page or the same I don't know, hotel or same location page, uh, then we'll take all of those URLs and try to figure out which one of those we should focus on the most. And we, we use all of those different factors kind of to figure out what the best canonical URL for this case would be. And when we pick a canonical URL, we tend to show that more in the search results. Uh, not that it would rank more, but kind of instead of the other variations of that same URL. And we would try to focus our crawling on that variation. Uh, so for example, if you have a URL with, with a parameter and a URL without a parameter, and we pick the one without a parameter as canonical, we'll probably crawl the one without a parameter a lot more frequently than the other ones. Uh, so that makes it a little bit so that it's less a technical issue uh, with regards to crawling. But obviously, we still have to discover all of those URL variations first before we can pick a canonical. Uh, so if you're creating a lot of new content and at the same time lots of separate URL variations are available for that new content, then that still means we, we have to spend a lot of time crawling all of those variations for one time at least and then figuring out, oh, we can pick a canonical and focus on the canonical URL. 
Sure. Thanks, Sean. So it's right for a lot of things. Uh, so basically, I, I can just tell you the scenario over here. So we have like I mean one, uh, the one of parameters that will have a check in, check out sort of parameters. Mm -hmm. The other one with the rooms variety or maybe you can say the category of the rooms. So usually, like I mean for internally as well, like for the internal language purpose, we try to keep it as a without parameters. But for certain cases, let's say from the JS links or something, it somehow linked as well from the parameters you are. So that's my question. Like when if I look at the kind of my link profile internally, so the majority of the links are coming through the parameters. It's not with the you can say the without parameter. Okay. So in that particular case, I'm assuming the Google will give more weightage to the parameter you are basically they are linked more in as compared to my other watch. Um yeah I, I think in a case like that if you can't kind of change the internal linking, then I would focus on all of the other aspects, uh, especially the URL parameter handling tool. I think that would probably be really useful for you there. And uh, for canonicalization, we don't just focus on one aspect. We, we look at the bigger picture. And we kind of say, well, these factors align with this URL, and these factors align with this other URL. And these are more important, so we'll pick that URL. Uh, so that's something sometimes you can't fix the internal linking, or sometimes you you have issues where you can't place a canonical on the page. And it's not that we require all of that to be the same, but the more consistent you can make it, the more likely we'll follow what you prefer to have. Sure. Thanks, John. Uh, John, can, uh, can I just have a one follow up on the same thing? Sure. So uh, canonical and uh, URL parameter, if, if we are using both, does it mean that we are telling Google not to crawl that particular page, therefore it will never see the canonical? So like in URL parameter, I am adding uh, no, this no URL to be crawled after this parameter, but all the URLs are there and they are pointing to canonical. So canonical will not be seen by Google. Uh, if we if we can't crawl those URLs, then we we don't see the rel canonical link there. That's correct. So 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 with the help of URL parameter, I am uh, telling Google not to crawl, not not by uh, robot.txt. Uh, robot um, so with the URL parameter tool, there there are different options that you can provide there, uh, including I think uh, telling Google to crawl one representative URL instead of these URLs. So I, I don't know exactly what 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 the phra phrasing is in the tool offhand, uh, but uh, there, there's uh, different variations. Specified URL probably. Yeah, yeah. It's it's something where uh, with the robots text, for example, you basically say don't crawl this. But with the URL parameter tool, you can give a little bit more nuance and say, well, these are sort orders, for example, and this is the default, and just use that one to crawl. But but with parameter, then the canonical URL I cannot specify. No, why? I I don't know how how the tool uh, works uh, kind of directly. But it's it's something where for I believe for some variations you can say uh, crawl this variation of the URL, and uh, in cases like that we should be able to. Let me just check. So yeah, John over here, like I mean, Google provides first two options, whether the content is being changed or not. If it is not changing, then it's something we have to pick an option, OK, let the Google decide. And the, if the content is changing, then it gives you the option in what manner it is changing. So maybe it is sorting, is it filter? Or maybe we, you have a different sort of combination. Or even though if you do not sure, maybe you can leave it as blank and then just select I mean, whether you want that URL to be crawlable or not. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just opened the, the web center, help center page. So this, and it, so it basically has is... different variations. So uh, it's something where you, you can tell us which one we, we should pick. So Ramesh, this, this is the case for duplicate URL after your query parameter. All the URLs are duplicate content. In this case, I want to tell Google not to crawl any URL after right. that parameter. So in this case, John, I cannot uh, use canonical. Why? Because canonical is main page, not after any query parameter. I don't quite understand. I, I feel 
like it, it would be really useful to have uh, explicit examples of what you're looking at there. And for that, okay. it would probably be useful to have something like a help forum post where you have some exact URLs that, that we can look at and uh, kind of give some input based on that. So yeah, sure. Th I think that would be useful because it's I, I'm really confusing doing that just live in the Hangout. And I have to double check the settings in Search Console how that, uh, how that actually looks. Yeah, sure. All right. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Hi. Yeah. John, and uh, even I have the same doubt in URL structure. So let's say, like, you know, I have a URL in a folder lava. So the, after domain.com and after one folder is there, and after the uh, end of the URL is there, last URL is there. So in case I didn't create anything in a folder level, let's say for cars, www.abc.com slash cars slash best cars in India. But www.abc.com slash cars, I didn't create any page. If a if user go to the page, it will go to 404. So is there any impact will create for the final URL? Because there is nothing in a folder level, but still the final URL is there. That's fine. That's so perfectly fine. fine. Yeah. That, that doesn't matter at all. Uh, we, we see URLs as identifiers of the content. And uh, we, we don't expect that. Like if you have a directory-based structure that all of the folders will work individually, um, that's, that's essentially something that you can have, but you don't need to have. And it's not something that would change anything from our point of view. Uh, also, if you, for example, remove a lot of content on your website. So will it break the priority of the page? Or... No, no. It's, it's perfectly fine. No. Yeah. Cool. All right. Let me run through some of the no, thanks, other. So sure. yeah, uh, internet is not good. Actually, I couldn't be able to hear your voice. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Um, no, it's it's perfectly fine to to have this setup where you have folders and the individual folder URLs don't. Oops. Uh, Again, it's it's completely fine to have folders, and uh, the folder URLs don't need to have uh, content on their own. That's perfectly fine. All right, let me no, see thanks, if I can. Uh, sure. Uh, let's let's run through some of the other questions that were submitted. Um, is using three hundred two redirect for affiliate links a bad practice? So you basically have slash vitamins, and it redirects to vitamin shop with your affiliate URL. Uh, is that a problem or not? From our point of view, that's perfectly fine. Uh, there is nothing that uh, we would consider bad there. Uh, I, from, from my point of view, because this is really nothing that provides any additional value for your website in the sense that uh, it looks better by having redirects to your affiliate pages or not. Personally, I would recommend uh, using less complexity and not setting up these kind of redirects and just linking to that site directly. Um, I, I think you, you just save yourself the effort of trying to maintain all of these things individually. Uh, question about the site link search box. The, not about how to implement it, but basically, uh, like how do I make it shown or not? Um, so one of the things that, that I've seen with the site link search box is if you set up the markup for this on your site, then this is something that takes quite a long time to actually be in effect. Uh, so it's not like other types of content where we can see maybe crawl that page once or twice, and then we can show that rich result type in the search results. The site link search box is something that we really need to see for the long run. And sometimes it takes a month, maybe even longer, to be visible in the search results. And also, the markup for the site link search box doesn't mean that we will show a site link search box for your site. Uh, but rather, if we show a site link search box for your site, then with that markup, we can pick the one that you prefer. Like if you have an internal site search, then we can show, show that one instead. Uh, so those are kind of the, the tricky aspects there in that we don't always show this. 
uh, for most sites. And when you do provide this markup, we need to see it for, for a longer period of time before it's visible in the search results. Hey, John. So Hi. on this site in search box, so we have a main website, plus we have international website as well. So if my this site in search was appearing for my main domain, but it is not appearing for my other country website, but they are somehow in present in subfolder structure. So how can I enable the same thing for my subfolder structure websites? Yeah, again, we, we would see those as separate websites. And uh, we, we don't always show the site link search box. So that's something where I, I think like we, we might show it for one country version, but not the other country version. Uh, we might show it for one brand within a bigger company, but not for another brand. Uh, so that's something that, uh, from, from our point of view, is, is just individual across different websites. Um, so in that, basically, having a same brand, having a, some similar kind of practices, so if Google seeing is one country is eligible, but not the other one. So what is the kind of the idea behind it? Like, I mean, showing for the one country, not for the other. Um, it's it's mostly something where we we try to provide value for users when they search, and uh, we we try to provide it in a way that uh, makes makes sense for the users. So uh, in this in that sense, it's not something that we would always show for a website for for queries, but rather when we can recognize that it makes sense to show it for for users for specific queries, then we'll try to show that. Uh, so what you're probably seeing is that for, for some countries, we've noticed that it makes sense to show it to users. And for other countries, we're, we're not sure yet. Or we, we see conflicting signals that tell us, well, maybe people just want to go to the home page or want to go to a main page for that, that brand. Or maybe they interact with that website differently, uh, all of those things. So that's something where it it can be normal that for one country you see it, for another country you don't. All right. Thanks. Yeah, I, I wish there were an easier way to kind of force some of these things. But uh, it is something that we've noticed that uh, sometimes it makes more sense to show it, and sometimes it doesn't make as much sense. Uh, let's see if I can run through some of the remaining questions. Uh, using hreflang on all pages of a multilingual sitemap is that a, or wait on all pages or on a multilingual sitemap which is best both of those work sitemap or the on page markup uh, is retrieving images through json or jquery seo friendly sometimes um, it sounds like you're doing lazy loading and we have a bunch of guides for lazy loading and search so i would double check those uh, you can also kind of simply check the page with the mobile-friendly test to see if those images load or not. That's a good way to get a first glance. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, we have a page like this one. There are a lot of areas that you can click on. You have a pop-up with text. I don't like this design, but the designers do. And I will prefer that all text was visible to the user all the time without any pop-up. Um, so my question is, how will Googlebot read this page? Will Googlebot uh, kind of be able to click on the page or see the content itself? Uh, so I, I didn't have time to double check this particular page. But in general, there are two setups that can be done for, for this kind of behavior, where you have elements on the page that you can click on or that you hover over to see text. Uh, one is that the text itself is actually loaded when the page is loaded and is just not visible by default. Uh, that's usually something that works fine for indexing. Uh, the other approach is that the, when you click on the, an element or you hover over an element, there's actually JavaScript that goes to the server and pulls that content and then shows that page. Uh, that's something that we would miss because we don't know where to click or where to hover with Googlebot's mouse. Uh, so those are kind of the two approaches there. One simple way to double check if it works or not is to take a piece of text that is shown in one of those pop-ups and just search for that. And if you can see that your page is being shown for that, uh, that piece of text, then we can obviously index that content and show it in the search results. 
Um, a question about paywall markup for subscription websites. Uh, there's an example for news article markup in the developer documentation, but how would you mark up a BBS or user reviews? Um, I believe the, um, what is it, the flexible sampling um, markup is specific to news article and similar structured data types. So uh, it would probably be stretching it to use that to mark up a BBS or kind of a forum-based setup. Uh, so I don't know if that would really be suitable there. Uh, I would double check the how how the the type of markup would fit for your particular pages, uh, in the sense that I, I believe this wraps up to creative work in schema.org, and it might be that there's a subtype that fits the type of content that you have. Uh, if articles don't have images and the image element is required, is it fine to use a website logo for images in the paywall markup? Um, that feels a bit wrong in the sense that uh, the image would not be specific to that article. Uh, so that's something that I would personally try to avoid in, in a case like that. Um, I also don't know if the image is actually a required property for the article markup. If it is, then that's something that, obviously, it would make sense to show an image that matches your actual content. Uh, you can think of it this way in that we, we show the image, for example, in the Discover feed uh, together with the article. And if it were just your logo, then that would be kind of weird for users to see there. And it probably wouldn't encourage people to go to your pages if they just see kind of a generic logo instead of the actual content uh, or an image that actually matches the content. Um, I have a site merge problem. I merged two large sites together six months ago. Uh, tens of thousands of URLs involved. 301 redirects were made for everything. Uh, however, I noticed Google is still showing the old merge domain for many product queries that don't include the old site's name. Uh, what, is, what is showing in the SERPs is only the old URLs, but with the new title tags and meta descriptions, clicking on the result for the old domain redirects you to the new one. Uh, these queries are mostly you commonly use model numbers or product names by manufacturers. Um, why is Google showing my old domain? So I, I think, on, on the one hand, site mergers always take a little bit longer. So that's, that's something where I would expect it to take a couple of months. You said six months ago. So it seems like it has been a couple of months. Uh, the other aspect there is that if you're seeing the content of the new page in, in the search results with the URL of the old page, then what is, is likely happening there is we're able to crawl those different variations of the URLs, like the old URL and the new URL. And we find the, the content there. So we find the new content. Um, however, it's a matter for us now to figure out which URL we should show in the search results, which is kind of the canonicalization aspect there. So we see the new URL, we see the old URL. Uh, we see there's a redirect from the old URL to the new URL. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty strong sign for us. However, there might be other signs uh, that point at the old URL for us. So maybe some of the internal links have not been updated. Uh, maybe the sitemap file has not been updated. Maybe there are other things that you can do to update, like the canonical tags on these pages. Maybe you have uh, hreflang annotations on these pages. Um, all of those things essentially add up. And that's something where we will try to pick the appropriate URL to show in the search results. And it sounds like we're picking the old URL at the moment. Uh, one thing that might happen here is that this will just settle down over time. Another thing might be that you can kind of go through all of those different aspects and double check to make sure that they're all really pointing at the new URL. Uh, on the positive side, uh, switching between the URLs does not change anything from the ranking. Uh, so just because we're showing your old URLs in the search results doesn't mean that they're ranking lower or they're ranking higher or any differently. We're essentially saying for the slot in the rankings, we have multiple URLs that we can show with the same content. 
and we're going to show this URL, or we're going to show that URL. Uh, so from, from that point of view, it's not a critical thing that you need to resolve right away, uh, but rather take your time, double check all of the, the details to make sure that all of the internal linking is correct. Um, you can use some, some third-party crawler tools to double check the crawling of your website. There's some really good ones out there nowadays. And uh, double check all of the annotations on your site, all of the things that are not visible by default, like the canonical meta, uh, the canonical link, uh, the any hreflang annotations that you have on there, all of those things, and make sure that they align with the new version. And then over time, that should settle down again. Uh, hi, John. What do you think about the practice of some big, big publishers tagging all outgoing links with rel nofollow? Um, from what I know, the reasoning behind this is that uh, with follow links, you would leak link juice and then rank worse. Um, so that's definitely wrong. Uh, it's definitely not the case that if you use normal links on your website, that you would rank any worse than if you put nofollow links on all outgoing links. Uh, I, I suspect it's even on the contrary, that if you have normal linking on your web page, then you would probably rank a little bit better uh, over time, essentially because we, we can see that you're part of the normal web ecosystem. Uh, so it's definitely not the case that you have any kind of ranking advantage by marking all outgoing links as nofollow. Uh, the one reason that I've seen from, from talking with a lot of publishers is that uh, they're, they're often just not sure which of these outgoing links are kind of paid links or placed there because of some arrangement with the, uh, the author. Or maybe they have paid articles as well in between, and they just don't know like, how to deal with that. And it's more a matter of their kind of like trying to stay on a safe side of like, we will put no follow on these links because we, we don't know which ones we can trust. And from my point of view, that is also problematic in the sense that I, I understand not, uh, not knowing which links you can trust. But essentially, if you're a news publisher, you should trust what you're writing about. Or you should be able to, to understand which part of the content that you write about is actual content that you want to have indexed like that that you want to stand for. And if these are things that you want, want to stand for, then make sure that you have normal links on there. Make sure that uh, you're, you're kind of referring to that content as something that, yes, I, I can stand behind this link because I researched this topic, and this is the, the kind of the, the source. Uh, this is maybe some other resources that lead to more information on this topic. This is what I, I researched from. This is an authority that I'm quoting. All of these things are kind of reasons to place normal links on a page. Uh, so from, from that point of view, so I, I would certainly find a way to make sure that you don't unnecessarily have to nofollow every outbound link. Yeah, so John? Yes. You mean to say even we are putting no follow links or do follow links, whatever it is, it will never affect our rankings, right? I I think I can never say never, but uh, it it definitely is not the case that if you no follow all of the links on your site, you will rank any better. Yeah, even if we put some do follow links on our website, also it doesn't mean that we will rank our rank will drop or our link juice will pass because we are worrying about our link juice only. Like, let's say if you are just putting 10 do follow links of other sites, and of course, of course, as per the theory and guidelines, maybe we, are, we just came to know that our link choose is getting passed, and because of that, our authority will get down. So, is that true? Um, I, I don't think you would see any change on your site's page rank with, with regards to kind of no follow links or normal, normal links. Yeah, because your tools like HRF, even we, when we just read about the blogs, even they are saying like if the site's having uh, 70 plus authority sites, then you can just give the link over there. But they didn't mention that whether it's a do follow or no follow. But here we are talking about the same. If you are putting no follow and do follow, it will never affect the rankings. So that's what. It, of course, we know that if you put do follow, the link just will pass. But again, uh, some controversial things are happening. I I don't quite follow your question, but. Uh, it, again, it's, it's something where ha having normal links on a web page for content that you want to stand for, I, that's 
perfectly fine. That's totally expected from our point of view. Of course, we even we are seeing some US sites. Of course, they are just getting links and they are just putting links of other sites also. Of course, they are ranking on top. But here only we are worrying about uh, putting do follow links or no follow links. Yeah. So I, I think, first of all, I, I wouldn't focus too much on what other sites are doing. Uh, and I wouldn't assume that other sites are always just ranking because of the links that they got. Uh, but, but rather, I'd, I'd really just focus on, on your own sites and make sure that what you're, what you're providing there and what you're linking to matches what, what you want to, to stand for with those pages. And it's also not something where you can say, well, I will no follow all of these links, but I will link to CNN and Google and Wikipedia because that looks good. Uh, that's, that's not something, from our point of view, that would make your pages look any more important than they are. Uh, but rather, link, link to the sources that you want to have linked to, link to the places that you think make sense for your users. And if there are things that you're doing where maybe you have an ad on a page, or maybe uh, you're working together with a friend who also has a web page, then of course, those are the kind of things you would like to, like to know follow, uh, because it's clear that this is a link that is there kind of for, for other reasons. Uh, but everything else where you're linking between from your site to some other site because you're providing kind of saying this is a reference or this is a source or this is more information that you can look at, then definitely just link normally. There's, there's no reason to put a no follow there just kind of because you're afraid that if, if you like link out too much, that's somehow problematic. Oh, yeah, sure. Though. Thanks. Sure. All right. We're a bit over time. Uh, and wow, we still have so many questions left. So I don't think I can, I can manage to get through those. Um, I, I think we'll stop here. Um, what I'll do now is uh, pause the recording and upload that to YouTube. And hopefully, that just works. Uh, as always, uh, thank you all for joining in. Thanks for the many questions. Uh, it's cool to see that more people can join here now. Um, and I'll set up the dates for the next couple versions as well. And uh, we, we can see if this, this setup continues to work. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a live stream for these anymore, uh, at least not at the moment. Uh, but we, we do have the recording, so that's good. All right. Then I wish you all a great weekend and hope to see you all again in one of the future episodes. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, John. Bye, John. Now, if I can Bye. figure out how to stop the recording. <laughs>